Hello, everyone. Thank you so much. I hope you had a good uh, break. I hope you're re enjoying reunion weekend so far. Uh, I am Ramsey Sargent. For those of you who don't know me yet, I am the I'm an EMBA Global 2005, but I am also the um, executive director of alumni engagement at London Business School. So it is a pleasure to welcome you all back here this weekend. It is a particular pleasure to <laughs> welcome you to the fantastic session we have next which uh, is part of our Think Ahead series. So this panel is featured as one of our new Think Ahead events, and it's a podcast series which offers evidence-based discussions and insights to help you navigate big business issues. With the global economy under multiple interconnected pressures from war and climate change to inflation and supply chain disruption, understanding the impact and outlook for business is difficult. This panel will explore the challenges and opportunities of the global economic landscape for business in a wide-ranging discussion covering issues including deglobalization, monetary policy, inflation, cryptocurrency, decentralized finance, artificial intelligence, and supply chain. Our faculty will help you navigate complexity. I'm pleased to say that our moderator will be Isha Nelson, business and economics reporter at the New York Times. Then we have, we've changed the order here, Nico Sava, Professor of Management Science and Operations and Chair of the Management Science and Operations Faculty. Jeremy Gallien, Professor of Management Science and Operations. Lucrezia Reichlin, Professor of Economics. And Richard Portes, Professor, Professor of Economics, Academic Director, AQR Asset Management Institute. Over to you. Thank you. Um, welcome, everyone. I first would like to say thank you for leaving the beautiful weather outside <laughs> and coming in to join us. I promise we will absolutely make it worth your while. So as the title of this session says, we're talking about issues and uncertainties in the global economy. We only have about an hour this afternoon, and there are way, way too many to get through in that small amount of time. So we're just going to pick a select few to talk about and discuss, and hopefully also take away some of the opportunities that are part of um, dealing with some of these challenges. And anyway, we don't want to depress you all too much on a Friday afternoon. So I'm going to ask each of my esteemed panelists here to just introduce the topic that they're going to be talking about a little bit more in the Q&A session afterwards. So, Lucrezia, I'm going to ask you to begin by introducing the topic you'll be talking about today as one of the major issues facing the global economy. Thank you very much, and good afternoon, everybody. So I will talk about inflation and monetary policy. Uh, you know that uh, you know, inflation is back, at least for the moment, mm -hmm. and uh, central banks are pursuing the sharpest tightening that we have seen since the Second World War. And uh, I think it's important to appreciate uh, this fact that uh, the tightening, we hadn't seen anything like that uh, in many, many years. So the question is, are they doing too much or are they doing too little or better for, you know, since we are talking about uncertainty this afternoon, what are the risk of doing too much or the risk to do too little? So I think to answer that question, I just want to have a few initial observations. The first of all is uh, we should ask ourselves what kind of shock, why all of a sudden we have seen inflation. And there is a debate out there, demand, supply, fiscal policy, whatever. So my view is that uh, if we talk especially about Europe, this is mostly a supply-driven shock. And I'm talking here about energy and supply chains. And this means when we talk about energy, that uh, since European citizens are not producers of energy, are net importers of energy, that shock has made all of us poorer. This is not the case for the US because they are net exporters. However, for both the Eurozone and Europe in general and the US, we have seen a very lots of change in relative prices. And changes in relative prices uh, creates a dynamic of inflation which is very difficult to understand. So that, uh, you know, first uh, energy goes up and then manufacturing prices go up because they are direct uh, users of energy. Mm -hmm and then services because they're user of manufacturing products and so on and so forth. So that's a chain. We create a persistence which central banks have a very hard time to understand. Now, the other uh, characteristic of this inflation is that inflation expectations have been stable. And this is very different from the inflation of the 70s that only Richard and I were there when that happened, okay? So, but we remember that. 
So, um, so with that background, then we can ask, uh, okay, where are we now after you know, more than a year of, of tightening? And uh, my view is that we have tightened enough, and I think it would be dangerous to tighten more. My calculation on how much you know, above, uh, I mean, how much tightening there is, uh, is, uh, you know, 110 basis points for the U.S., more than a neutral situation, and about 50 basis points for the Eurozone above neutral situation. Having said that, um, I think that the, a discussion about inflation should also take a more long-term view. Mm -hmm. And on the long term, there are maybe factors that will drive inflation on average to be, uh, you know, higher than in the past, and these have to do with the need of public and private investment uh, that we will see in the next decades uh, as a consequence of the many risks the economy is facing, uh, especially climate change. Thank you so Thank much. You. Great. Um, Richard, can I ask you to introduce your topic? Yes, crypto. Uh, the good news is that crypto is not a threat to the financial system. I spent the past year and a half chairing a task force, European task force, that just produced a report addressing precisely this question, crypto and financial stability. And I can say with some confidence that right now, crypto is not a threat to financial stability. The bad news is multiple. <laughs> there's no obvious, to me, there's no obvious use case for crypto, the first. Second, if you wanted to use, think about money, crypto as money, forget it. It's not money, it doesn't perform, couldn't perform the same function uh, as money being a unit of account, store of value, medium of exchange, very efficiently. Um, and the so-called stable coins are simply so-called stable coins. Some of you will know that Tether, for example, mm -hmm. one of the best known, broke its peg um, last year once, and has just broken its peg recently, the past four days. Tether is um, not as dramatically below one as it was um, a, a year ago for a while, but uh, it, it's, it's been four days now that it's been distinctly below its peg. Um, and uh, there are other stable coins, so-called stable coins, that, aren't, that have shown they're not stable either. Uh, oh, but this is great. It's decentralized. You don't need to trust anybody, right? Trust the code. Excuse me. Typically, Crypto transactions have to go through exchanges of one sort or another, and even to convert crypto into fiat money through banks. Well, look at what happened to the two banks that specialized in crypto. They went down, okay? Signature and Silvergate. Um, and as for the exchanges, well, there's FTX, yes. Um, Coinbase is now being sued by the United States. Binance is now being sued by the United States. Um, uh, I don't think I want to deal with them anyway. Um, and then um, the question comes, uh, what is it that we can do about this? What should the regulators do to deal with those, with those issues, with the bad news? And the answer there is very different in different jurisdictions. Europe now has entering into force this year a very detailed markets and crypto assets right, set of regulations, okay, uh, meant for consumer and investor protection. The U.S. has no such thing and is not likely to have any such thing for quite some time. So that leaves the SEC free to do what the SEC wants to do, which is effectively kill off crypto. And they're doing a fairly good job of it. Uh, so that's the two, diff two, two places. U.K. is somewhere in the middle, um, but Rishi Sunak said himself he was thrilled that Andreessen Horowitz is going to set up their big crypto office, European crypto office, here in London. Isn't that wonderful? Well, I don't think it's wonderful, uh, but um, we, we can talk about that. Um, France, we didn't let, we in the UK didn't let Binance register here because people could see, hmm, there's, there are problems with that outfit. France welcomed them with open arms. They're now not quite so sure that that was a great thing to do. Um, so Singapore initially uh, was very friendly and then, in September of last year, decided they didn't want to be friendly after all. Hong Kong, on the other hand, is proving to be super friendly right now, or trying to be super friendly. So you have very different approaches across the globe to crypto. I know which side I'm on. 
Wonderful. Hey, don't trust the humans, trust the code, Nikos. I think this brings us nicely to you. <laughs> Excellent, because the topic I've chosen to talk about is all about coding and generative AI. So, so you're surprised. So, so who, who's using, who, who has ever used ChatGPT or Bing or none of that? Most of you. Who's using it every day? Okay, a few of you. Okay, good, good, good. Did you know that ChatGTP, the technology behind it, existed for at least five years? I've been using it in my classroom, so LBS for at least two years, and nobody cared, and now you all do? <laughs> so, so, so what has changed? I think, uh, I, I mean, there, there, there were two innovations. So, so the first was that these models became a lot larger in the last uh, year or so. And uh, sort of by becoming a lot larger, they developed capabilities that surprised many industry observers, certainly me, and I think also, to be honest, they're developers. So, so, so size seems to matter in this case, and size enables these uh, uh, sort of uh, codes to become more sophisticated, to generate output, which is text or images or video these days, that, uh, that's, that's close to the quality of that produced by humans. The second thing that happened also sort of about nine months ago was that uh, OpenAI created this wrapper around uh, uh, ChatGTP, uh, uh, sort of, which made it sort of available to anybody with an internet browser and very so nice. The rest of us could join you, basically. The rest of us, <laughs> could, uh, with, without needing to code, without needing to use any complex interface, you could use it. So, so uh, I mean, you know, and you know, it, why is this important? Because uh, the, the ability to to create uh, sort of uh, uh, knowledge, oh, sorry, uh, text that's that's at human level quality. Uh, is, 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 is having the potential to automate uh, 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 tasks that are difficult, difficult to, to codify, tasks that are related to creativity, tasks that are related to the knowledge-based uh, work that uh, I'm guessing most of us are engaged with. So, and these were exactly the tasks that were very difficult to, to automate in the past. So, so this is sort of, you know, a, a, a new era we're living in where it's possible to now start automating knowledge-based work. So, so because this is a panel about evidence, I wanted to spend a few minutes talking about what the evidence uh, tells us about how good these models are in automating knowledge-based work. So there was uh, sort of, you know, there are four studies that I think pass the sort of, you know, the, the scientific threshold of being considered uh, uh, worthy to mention in this panel. The first one looked at, um, at uh, uh, knowledge-based uh, workers. These are mid-level professionals and their ability to, to write uh, uh, memos and emails. And what the study found is that compared to those that didn't have access to JGTP, those that did were able to do the work 37% faster, and they were rated as doing the work a little bit better than those that didn't have access to, to JGTP. Now, can you imagine, when was it the last time that knowledge-based work had a 37% productivity boost? Mm -hmm. Never. So another study looked at uh, pro, uh, computer coders, and those that had access to JGTP were able to complete coding tasks faster, and they uh, said they were more satisfied with their work because they spent less time getting stuck on problems and more time on the creative part of coding. Uh, a study looked at uh, how uh, 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 ChatGTP was giving advice to patients and compared it to the advice that uh, doctors were giving to patients. And a panel of experts preferred the advice of ChatGTP to the advice of human doctors 79% of the time. <laughs> and patients found the advice given by ChatGTP as more empathetic. <laughs> <laughs> So, so, so you know, you know we're in trouble if uh, computers are faster, <laughs> uh, slightly better quality, and more empathetic than us. Um, so, so, and, and let me just finish with one observation: that, 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 that some of the studies also looked at who benefits from the use of chat GTP, which workers benefit the most. And, and by and large, the findings are that the least experienced workers, the workers that perform kind of you know less well compared to sort of you know the average or the most experienced workers they are those that perform, their, their performance increases the most by using ChatGTP. So in a sense, you can think of ChatGTP as the great equalizer in terms of uh, performance. And all of these are going to have sort of tremendous implications, and I'm not sure what all of these implications are, but I'm sure for one thing that uh, they're going to increase uncertainty, which is the theme of the panel. Thank you so much. Jeremy, can I ask you just to briefly introduce your topic as well? The first question I'm asking myself is why am I here? Um, and, um, and so, you, you know, I've I sort of been teaching supply chain management for, for a long time now. This is, this is my fieldwork research. 
Um, and so why am I here? Um, it, I'll do it like Richard, bad news. It's probably not a, um, a, a streak of bad luck. <laughs> so COVID, Brexit, Ukraine, you know, if you're here in the UK, some disruptions. Um, it, you know, it's not, uh, and there's reasons why it's not, why I'm here, it's not a streak of, ba of bad luck. Uh, sort of climate change, the weather disruptions, um, epidemics, more people living in the world, those people travel more, communicate more, and so on. Um, geopolitics, of course, but you also have um, globalization, there's a general trend, increasing, ever, and uh, market demands, so more, we all want uh, customized products, we want them cheaper, there's more competition, there's, we want a more larger selection of these products. And what does that mean in terms of the supply chains that are required in order to satisfy this market? They're broader, more widespread, more disseminated, and more exposed to this trend of more and more disruptions in the supply chain. Okay, so that's, that's why it's, uh, you know, I'll, I'll have my seat here in this outlying panel. Um, that's the bad news, some of the bad news. I'm, I'm sparing some of it in the, in the spirit of uh, keep, keeping the, looking forward to the weekend. Good news, though. The good news is that there's, a lot of, um, there's lots of opportunities relative to what um, firms are doing. There's been a lot of work thinking through um, what, what's best practice, how should companies, organizations respond to these increasing threats. Okay, and there's, and there's uh, very well known, they're not easy to do, but they're well identified uh, type of ideas and concepts and tools that, that can be applied. Um, I'd, say the, I'd say the first one is sort of pretty well established. It's to sort of move from firefighting and becoming a, a good crisis manager to, to sort of looking at it as a strategy much more in advance and really looking at assessment, prevention, mitigation, and sort of action that companies can do in these areas. Um, so that, that's the first one. The second one is the realization that you know, risk management, for many of us in companies, it means these risk registers, okay, ERM, risk registers. I bet most of you, uh, you know, have been involved in those. So you basically identify risk and think of risk as events, okay, a cyber attack, a fire, an earthquake, a tornado, and so on. Uh, and so for each of these events, what's the probability, what's the impact, and what should we plan to do in case that hits? Um, and, and that's useful, in particular, for contingency planning for the high probability, high, high impact events. Um, but, the, but sort of the emerging paradigm that's sort of been proven to be much better is to not focus on all of these events. I mean, who forecasted that the, uh, that the boat was going to block the Suez Canal? Who forecasted that there was going to be an Icelandic volcano bringing down the European airspace? And so on and so forth. So the opportunity is to think instead of supply chains as um, assets, facilities, products, suppliers, transportation links. And for each of these assets, not think of the specific event that could disrupt them, but think of what would be the consequences and the actions that would be dictated by this particular asset being taken out. Okay, so that's the first idea. The second idea is using data, the raw kind of data, which is why those topics are obviously related. And, and the right kind of data here is the data that allows many people in organizations to make the right decision. It's very systemic. Resilience is dictated by what product you make, how you make them, where you have your suppliers, where you put your facilities, how you deal with your contract suppliers, where you do dual supply. And all of these decisions are made by pretty much everywhere in organizations. So you need the data that allows them to make these right decisions, taking into account risk. Um, and there's at least concepts are there for doing this, revenue at risk, profit at risk. It's almost like a company that has to build up a bit of an insurance capability. So good news, there's tools that are you know, appropriate for this. Um, other opportunity to be good at resilience, sort of mapping out disruptions um, is first, uh, it's been this number of anecdotes, there's a study by Hengritz and Signal saying it does have a lasting impact on performance. Companies that are good at doing this, responding, planning to disruptions, 
uh, have a sustainable, long-lasting advantage on the market. Um, and, then the, and then the other good news, if you wish, is that you, you gain strategic advantage. And if you become good at doing this, you also become good at doing other things, like knowing supply chain transparency. Who are your suppliers? Your suppliers, suppliers. What data do you have about them? And it's also aligned, synergistic, uh, with sustainability. Okay, the, the kind of relationship, tools, mapping, data you need, well, if you start having to worry about your supplier, 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 extended responsibility in the supply chain, for example, it's the same kind of data that you need to make the decisions about making your supply chain resilient in the first place. If you're good at resilience, uh, there's lots of synergies with sustainability um, as well, as well as, of course, running your operation in a more um, transparent way for your customers um, to, to see. Okay, I'll Thank leave it at you. that. Thank okay. you. Okay. Um, they're all very naughty and take much longer than I told them to. <laughs> so now we're going to whiz through a bunch of questions in much more detail. There's amazing ways to kind of set us off. Um, look, actually, I'm, I want to come back to you and your question of inflation. To me, it feels like we're in a, a bit of a new phase with the inflation, I'm going to say issue, problem, question, where inflation has come down quite far from its peak in the US for certain, in the Eurozone, unfortunately, a little bit, little bit less here in the UK. Um, and a lot of policymakers implied to me that, you know, that was the easy bit. A lot of that was based, especially in Europe, on what's going on with the energy markets, and that's in a better state. So now the difficult bit is getting actually to this 2% medium-term target in all these places. I'm wondering, you said there that you felt actually that central banks had tightened enough. Mm. Do, you, do you feel that actually this is maybe, you know, being a little bit dramatic, and maybe it's not the difficult part? How do you assess this next bit they have to do and why and just a little bit more detail why exactly you think they, they could be they could be done yes my view is that, that, that because this is a uh, is a is the shock which comes with a lot of changes in relative prices and that has uh, originated uh, from uh, energy and disruption of supply chains is absolutely to be expected uh, that uh, when energy goes down, headline inflation goes down very rapidly. And in fact, it has gone down more rapidly than at the beginning of the 80s when we had a similar type of shock. And this is, you know, the, you know our memory. Uh, but it is also to be expected that uh, the underlying inflation, what is called core inflation, which is mostly, uh, you know, service, mostly service, would go down, uh, you know, would has picked up later, mm -hmm. but will go down much more slowly. So in my calculation, okay, so evidence-based, when we look at the past for both the US and the Eurozone, the delay from the first shock until infl core inflation goes back to the initial conditions uh, is about 60 months. Mm -hmm. So we are within the norm. I must say that uh, my view is not the mainstream view. <laughs> so that's to say, um, so I yeah. may be wrong, okay? So, but uh, this is, uh, uh, I've just written a report in which I've been trying to argue this point. Well, no, it's an interesting one. I think part of the challenge we face is that central bankers have become a little bit more nervous about their forecast. You know, they've had, they've kind of apologized for the fact that they underestimated inflation. So even with um, the analysis you've done, they might not be so willing to sit on their hands and wait. And as we go into the summer, I think it's going to be interesting. You know, we saw the ECB raising rates yesterday, saying they were going to do more. The day before the ECB, ECB pausing, uh, the Fed pausing, and next week probably the Bank of England going ahead. How do companies react to this uncertainty this summer, where it's going to be less clear what each? Yeah, I think uh, that uh, you know, what you said is right. I, I think that uh, uh, I mean what um, people have picked up is that there is a little bit of confusion and uncertainty from the side of central bankers. It is to be understood because the situation is totally, you know, new to a certain extent, and that uh, so monetary policy has become more an exercise of risk management, like uh, Jeremy was saying. Uh, so it is really about balancing this risk. But the the thing that I find in, in incredibly surprising is that if you look at the expectations of companies and the professional forecasters they are quite stable around the 2% target if you look at uh, the medium term, which is two to three years. Mm. And uh, so in a way, that credibility has not been lost, mm -hmm. which one, you know, maybe it will be lost, you know, because, you know, the, 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 the communication is not ideal. 
I mean, both Lagarde and Powell gave an impression of uh, not exactly knowing what was going to happen next, data-driven, this is the message that they keep on giving. But actually, expectations are quite anchored. Now, if expectations are anchored, that means that uh, there is sort of uh, a little bit of a luxury to go a bit slower. Remember that uh, monetary policy act with a lag of about two years. So we are only now seeing the effect of the tightening that uh, has been already implemented, especially in the credit markets where you know, the numbers for uh, credit uh, conditions, uh, loan demands have deteriorated quite fast, both in Europe and in the US. Absolutely, so how should um, companies respond to this period of higher interest rates that will probably last a while, this lagged effect where we're only actually starting to experience um, the tighter policy uh, financing conditions. What are, what are those implications when it comes to investment, comes to other decisions that our audience will be thinking about? Well, uh, you know, when uh, Paul Volcker, who is a hero, former president of the, of the Federal Reserve, and uh, is a hero because he tamed that inflation of, of the early 80s, when he was asked, how did you manage to tame inflation? He said, well, I created a few banking crises. <laughs> and, uh, you know, this is probably what we're going to see. So we are going to see that, uh, you know, some weakness in the financial market. Of course, the mortgage market is the first to be hit. In the UK, there will be, you know, a, a lot of mortgage, uh, uh, you know, holders that will have to roll, roll over, uh, you know, their loans. And, uh, and so this is, uh, these people are going to be hit, okay? So this is typically, you know, the first people who would be hit. Eventually, this will have an effect in consumption. Now, consumption has been very weak in the Eurozone, not so much in the UK, so this is the difference. Um, but, uh, you know, the numbers uh, are, uh, have been surprising, uh, you know, on the upside so far, but uh, now we see increasingly some uh, weakness uh, in the, you know, in the, in the credit market especially, okay? So that's what, what we see. Basically some... Not so much in the labor market. This has been also the big puzzle that uh, central bankers have been confronted to because normally central bankers think, uh, well, the, there is first uh, unemployment uh, and then, uh, uh, you know, when you start tightening, uh, you, you, the first effect is on, on the labor market but partly because of the big changes in behavior in the labor market post-COVID, we have seen that uh, uh, unemployment has been quite low, and so the main channel of inflation has not really been the labor market. Uh, and, and just to make sure I understand your point that after the pandemic, and it was so hard to hire people again, companies have become much more resistant to letting people off now because That's they don't right. want to go through yes. that all over again. And then there have been in the US, and not so much in the Eurozone, the, uh, the great resignation. So mm -hmm. a lot of people have decided to stay home or to go part-time. So now this is gradually changing, but you know, post-COVID that was something that... Uh, Thank think, you. Yeah. Richard, I can't help but pull you in to talk about banking crises and we'll blame the criteria who brought them up. But you know, are we out of the woods yet? When we spoke a couple of months ago, we were sitting around the table just as Credit Suisse was being bought by UBS, Silicon Valley Bank had collapsed. It felt like we were right in the middle of a banking crisis. I've decided to become quite relaxed about it, but maybe I shouldn't be. No, I don't think uh, the banking crisis is over at all. Um, not in the United States, at least. Europe's a different story. European banks are pretty well capitalized uh, and are not as uh, sort of stuffed with low interest rate uh, low yielding assets as the American banks are. And that's the real problem. Uh, the problem of, here, I might disagree slightly with Lucrezia, uh, the problem there is not a mortgage market problem at all. Uh, not yet, anyway. The problem is uh, that the banks, in the period of very low rates, took on a lot of very low yielding assets, uh, whether they be long-term securities or long-term loans at low rates, okay? Then rates go up, and guess what? Um, where, what happens to your net interest margin? What happens to your depositors? Your depositors are getting virtually nothing on their deposits, but all of a sudden, now they've got an alternative. They can go to a money market fund that's gonna pay three, four, five percent, say. Um, and so what do you do as a bank? You've got to raise your deposit rates on deposits in order to stop the outflow. Uh, and 
that is the road to ruin. Uh, long term, not immediate, but what happens is effectively that the deposit franchise gets eroded and the banks, um, and, and we're talking particularly about the mid-range, mid-sized banks uh, in the US that I think are many of which are becoming zombies. Great, something to look forward to then. But while all this is happening in the Sorry. US, Sorry. <laughs> I would say something to look forward to, but while this is all happening in the US, how much should we in Europe be worried about spillovers from that? Because it, you can't quite, you know, there's Not an Atlantic lot. Ocean, but I don't think that's always enough. Not a lot. No, I don't think, as I say, I don't think it's a big threat to the European banking system. Um, we had the Credit Suisse uh, story, but that was really an exception. Very, very bad regulation. Um, and uh, and a, a, a sequence of mistakes that go over a whole, you know, a, a long period uh, that um, led this bank to uh, to effectively to failure. Um, but it wasn't a matter of a changing interest rate environment. That bank was effectively insolvent um, by the autumn of, of last year. They lost one third of their entire deposit base in three months, the last quarter of 2023. And you can't live very long that way. That's great. I'm going to move us on to a pretty wide ranging conversation about tech. And Nikos, I want to ask you, you know, McKinsey says generative AI is set to add up to 4.4 trillion of value to, global, to the global economy annually, as it automates up to half of all work between 2030 and 2060. Now, others are saying that AI could destroy humanity. <laughs> Which one is more likely? Both. Okay. <laughs> uh, I mean, so, so there's, there's implications of, of ChatGPT to sort of, you know, to, to, to the economy, I mean, the short-term implications, if you like. And I think there, McKinsey's study, you know, is, is, is spot on. So, so a lot of the work is going to be automated. And initially, it's going to be sort of, you know, more repetitive, sort of, you know, more menial tasks, but increasingly, it's going to be more creative tasks. And whenever you sort of, you know, have large productivity gains, I mean, two things happen. First, you need fewer people to complete the same amount of work, mm -hmm. but you also the cost of the work goes down, and therefore, work that was an economic to do before becomes sort of, you know, profitable to do. So the work expands. And, and typically, in previous sort of innovative uh, sort of shocks, uh, the, the latter effect dominated. So, so uh, we didn't see uh, 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 huge drops in employment after sort of you know previous shocks like the internet, for example. Uh, uh, but but uh, that's not to say that we shouldn't worry about this because uh, there might be issues with inequality, issues with more of the rents going to God's capital rather than workers, and we need to be prepared and we need to sort of uh, uh, not repeat the same mistakes that we have in the past. So that's on the economic side. Now, uh, I mean, more on the existential side, there's two types of worries. The first worry is that sort of, you know, bad actors might use this technology uh, uh, for uh, sort of, you know, certain purposes that are not desirable. For example, the cost of uh, writing fake stories that are customized to the interests of specific groups have come down dramatically. So perhaps it would be easier to sort of, you know, uh, create uh, campaigns uh, with fake news to try to manipulate democracy, elections, and so forth. Uh, but the, you know, more seriously, perhaps, uh, 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 you know, the studies that suggest that you can use ChatGPT to uh, get information as to how to create a, a pathogen that can create a pandemic and uh, with detailed instructions as to how to do this and where to order the material and what companies to order them from that are less likely to scrutinize your orders. Lovely. Which is kind of yeah. scared. Yeah, I'm scared. And um, so, so, so we need to, again, start thinking about how do we regulate this? How do we make it more difficult for people to misuse this technology? And then there's a third sort of, you know, category, which is even more existential, if you like, which is sort of, look, this comes from the fact that technology has improved immensely in the last year. So, so exponential improvement. So if it continues, it's a big if, there's very good reasons to believe that it might not. But if it continues, then we might find ourselves with having sort of artificial intelligence that's uh, sort of so much better than human intelligence that can continue improving uh, uh, on itself, by itself. And then people talk about the end of uh, sort of, you know, human domination on the planet, and we're gonna have this alien technology that uh, we have to, to sort of, you know, compete uh, with, uh, or at least contend with, uh, and that's something to worry about. 
Yeah, great. Um, <laughs> well, we will ponder that. Uh, you know, th this week was an interesting week, though, in terms of AI regulation. Yeah. The EU, uh, part, the European Parliament passed its draft law, um, which some people said is kind of maybe going to set the standard or at least is something that other countries can look to. I'm kind of curious if you could just talk us through a little bit about where some different locations stand at the moment in terms of regulation, um, in terms of like, you know, how you tackle both getting the economic advantages out while also we know that they're looking at how do we make, um, you know, things like chat GPT more mm. transparent? How do we curtail the use of facial recognition software so that, you know, and how do we decide when and we, we should and shouldn't use it and all these really complicated ethical privacy questions, you know, where, what's the landscape at the moment? I mean, you're right, it's, 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 it's a complicated question and, and at the heart of it, the fundamental trade-off of regulation is what it usually is. So, so on one hand, you want to protect consumers from sort of... Uh, uh, alien AI race taking over. From yeah. an alien AI, AI <laughs> from, from bad humans using the technology sort of, you know, in a nefarious manner or, or even, you know, from, from, from alien technology. But, but, you know, on the other hand, you don't want to stifle innovation. Okay, so you want to sort of to, to, to get the benefits, but you want to at the same time minimize the harm. So, so, so the, the, the regulation is really trying to identify where the harms might be coming from, uh, and uh, sort of at least in the short term, and try to sort of mitigate some of them. Uh, uh, sort of uh, the, you know, the Europe uh, uh, is on the forefront of regulation. It has been with uh, GDPR. Uh, uh, whether this has been effective or not, you know, we can debate that. In some dimensions, it has been more effective than others. Uh, uh, but other jurisdictions like uh, the, the, the UK view this as an opportunity to, to sort of, you know, allow uh, uh, our companies to develop faster with less regulatory oversight, uh, hoping that this will generate sort of, you know, an advantage in the, in the long run. Uh, uh, but, you know, I am a little worried that the UK is a little too, too relaxed about AI. Uh, uh, but, you know, at the same time, I mean, the current technology, the amount of regulation we need to do on the current technology, I think, is is relatively light. It's not as dangerous as people think it is. Uh, and it's not a foregone conclusion that we're going to have uh, sort of, you know, general AI that's going to be so much better than humans in the, in the, in the very near future. So, so right now, I think the right approach is to sort of monitor where the harms are coming from, be prepared to act if it seems like uh, sort of we're seeing uh, damage being generated. But this is so new, so I think it would be premature to start uh, regulating with very specific frameworks at this stage. Mm. What about, you know, companies now that, you know, they aren't AI companies, but they want to take advantage of what's out there. I'm just kind of curious about where do you start, where do you begin, what kind of opportunities are there that people can access today and not necessarily have to keep waiting for kind of more, more advancement? So there's actually a lot of opportunities to integrate uh, sort of generative, generative AI in sort of, you know, existing workflows. There are some problems to be overcome. So, so I know that a lot of banks, for example, and financial institutions in the UK have banned the use of uh, generative AI uh, within their systems. And the fear there is uh, sort of data security. So if you have employees putting in customers' information and asking sort of ChatGPT to write an email to the customer, I mean, that's data, that's information that's leaving the company systems and going sort of, you know, out, uh, shared in the internet. So, so, so the first challenge is to create sort of systems that exist within the firewalls of a, of, of a company so, so to safeguard information. And this is happening, but uh, we are maybe six months away from this sort of being rolled out. And the second, uh, so, so this is the infrastructure. So you need to get the infrastructure right. And the second thing you need to start doing is you need to start sort of examining sort of processes and re-engineering processes so that uh, sort of uh, 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 parts that can be, uh, 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 can, that can benefit from a productivity boost uh, from ChatGPT can sort of, you know, benefit from it. And then the third thing is to sort of, you know, put safeguards and guardrails uh, because this technology is not perfect, it's sort of, you know, immature, and you want to sort of catch uh, the, the instances where the technology is kind of failing to have the desirable impact. So I think these three parts. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Let's uh, move on to crypto, which is always a joyful roller coaster to be on. Um, you've already, you know, already told us about some of the failures, but I just wanted to go back to some of the use cases now. You know, what are the ways in which crypto decentralized finance can be used present tense, not future tense? I don't think there is a use case. <laughs> I don't think there's a demonstrated use case at all. Um, the uh, transactions. Uh, with these instruments are costly. 
-hmm. They're not so fast. Um, I can transfer money across uh, across borders actually now through my own bank very quickly. I don't need um, I don't need to use crypto and go through um, go through the blockchain and and spend actually a substantial fee in doing so. Uh, so you know if you can if anybody can show me they're all entitled to come up with one and some of you doubtless own crypto. I should have asked at the beginning. Uh, oh, we can ask now. <laughs> Show of hands. Ask now. No one will admit. Oh, I don't admit. That. Come on. If, if, really? if, that, if no, you know, come on. Two hands you, in the chat. You, are, you, are, you are statistical, completely outliers. Yeah, I just, I don't believe you. I, I just took a group of students <laughs> to, uh, to Francfort in Paris uh, and um, at one point spoke to an alumni group, uh, an alumni club in Paris. Uh, and they wanted to talk about crypto. And I asked them, you know, about a quarter to a third, I would say, of that group are own crypto. It's nothing, you know, there's nothing wrong with it. You know, if you want to gamble, that's fine. It's, a, it's gambling. And, and, and gambling is perfectly respectable, right? Um, I have nothing against gambling. But, um, uh, but that's what it is. So if somebody can give me a convincing use case that um, uh, that doesn't involve money laundering, <laughs> doesn't involve regulatory arbitrage, um, uh, then um, and doesn't involve fraud of any sort, uh, then okay, I'm ready to listen, but I haven't seen it. Okay, what about? I'm just curious about then the things that you described as being failures. You know, the exchanges that have collapsed, mm. stable coins. Is are they? Are they like real death blows to this industry, or am I, in a couple of years' time, are we going to be having a similar conversation? It was an interesting piece in that time. An interesting piece in the FT today uh, by their <laughs> crypto correspondent, who just came back from a, a crypto conference in Amsterdam, and said the mood was very downbeat, right? Uh, and that's partly because uh, because of not just of FTX, right? Uh, but the problems with a number of those, you know, it, you've got these outfits that are crypto asset service providers, these you know, CASPs, uh, and they commingle functions that you would not allow a traditional financial institution, a, a, an institution in the, in the standard financial system to do, right? To hold, hold deposits on, on, for, for depositors, not just to hold deposits, to lend, to act as an exchange, a London Stock Exchange, doing lending, excuse me, right? Um, this is not such a good idea. Uh, and that's what you have in the crypto space. So I think that, um, uh, that those institutions, which turn out, I mean, as I say, this is supposed to be decentralized finance, and yet a lot of it is going through these uh, these exchanges, which have turned out to be, in some cases, just purely fraudulent. Um, and it's not just FTX, Gemini. Um, there's this whole story. I keep on getting mixed up between Gemini and Genesis. One owes the other a lot of money, right? And it, and it hasn't got it. Right? And so that means that depositors are out, as it stands right now, about a billion dollars worth of whatever it is that them is worth. Of. Okay? Um, this is not good. Um, and, and that's where we are. Mm. But it, it does, you know, as you said at the start there, no threat to financial stability. Is the issue here that it's not entirely contained, right? That there are all these depos depositors out there without access to money, it's, that the industry doesn't completely go away. Is that why we talk about it so much? Well, there's a case, there is a case for consumer and investor protection. That's what the European Union has decided to do. One of my good friends and colleagues, um, and who served on the task force that I was heading, um, very distinguished professor of finance, uh, says, let it burn, right? Don't regulate it. Don't legitimize it by regulating it, okay? Um, you just let it implode. It'll implode. Uh, people will get hurt on the way, uh, that's for sure. But, you know, tant pis. <laughs> Stuff happens, you know? Um, and it, if it's gambling, you, know, you win a few, lose a few. Uh, and that, I think, that is really the difference right now between Europe uh, 
which is taking this detailed regulatory approach. The UK hasn't really decided where uh, we were. There is a, there's some conflict here. Those of you who um, are familiar with UK financial markets and so forth. In this case, there's a clear conflict between the Bank of England and their views on these issues and the treasuries or the, uh, or the ministry, okay? I wouldn't speak for the civil service and the treasury, but, um, but ministers are, as I said, including the prime minister, we want to be a center for financial innovation. So we want, you know, we want to be very friendly to crypto. The Bank of England says, no, oh, you know, we're sort of familiar with some of these problems and we've studied these problems here. This is not necessarily such a great idea. Um, and I think that's where we're at. They might just run down the clock to the next election, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask um, Jeremy, so if we could talk about supply chains a little bit here, because so I cover central banking uh, mostly and supply chains became, you know, all they talked about for a while there during the pandemic, but it was mostly this idea of supply chain bottlenecks, that these were kind of short term ish issues um, that were very much tied to the pandemic and that now they're easing, they say with their fingers crossed and inflation will improve, et cetera. But I feel like you're speaking of something bigger, something that's absolutely not, you know, transitory, more that supply chains have been disrupted um, for larger issues. I'm wondering if this is this geopolitical, is this extreme weather, conflict, all these things. Just take us back a little step in, in terms of like what those disruptions are that you think are the most serious um, that aren't, you know, that won't ease, that can't just be, you can't just wait them out. <clears throat> So yeah, we certainly would have, would have some disruptions that we would like to um, hope would be sort of transient bad luck. But when you step back, um, there's been a, a lot of the disruptions that are hitting companies, sort of weather related, uh, you know, fires, floods, hurricanes, a lot of these things are known to be linked to climate change. Um, so they're not, uh, you know, and, and it's been sort of measured so more and more. Uh, and they also have more and more damaging impact. There's, there's even, even sort of COVID, obviously it's very unprecedented in the history, the extent of it uh, to which it disrupted everything. Um, but the, 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 the underlying reasons that are creating pandemic um, are largely driven by how many people are on the planet and how many how much exchange there is between them. Mm. And that is a steady increase as well. Um, so, so the extent to which sort of small localized epidemics before can can really spread out is um, you know is really increasing as well. So, so that's on the uh, you know that and then, and then the uh, there's a back and forth and it's not clear. I mean, it's a choice how you design the supply chain. Do you, do you buy your things local uh, or halfway around the globe? Sort of cheapest total rent of car, lots of transport, lots of intermediaries. Uh, a lot of arbitrage of um, uh, the labor costs and transportation costs and so on. Um, but there is, you know, the, it's going to take a while before the world is flat with respect to these differentials in costs. And the, uh, the, the economic benefits, the financial benefits associated with cutting purchase costs, cutting the total rent cost, um, are enormous. Mm -hmm. you, you're just sort of going right to the bottom line when, when you cut purchasing. Um, so you've got this, so these are really strong, powerful incentives to expose supply chain through the design decisions that are made to this increasing trend of disruption. So yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, it's a, fun, sorry for the bad news, but that bit is definitely bad news. It's not uh, just COVID, it's not just Brexit, it, it's been really going on for, um, for, for a long time. And, and of course, what we experience of it, this, the, the exact disruptions happening in a given year, at that scale, yeah, we can be lucky, we can be unlucky, companies can be lucky or unlucky, but if you're sort of looking on a five, 10, 15 years horizon, it's very clear, it's not, it's not going away. You mentioned extreme weather, obviously linked to, to climate change. I was just thinking about the way supply chains are gonna have to change because of climate change, whether it's location of where you are in your the rest of your supply chain, whether that's 
trying to reduce emissions in line with transition plans that more and more companies are being asked to produce, or whether that's to take advantage of policy like the US Inflation Reduction Act. I'm just, you know, I, you mentioned all of these other things that are going to last for a really long time, and then you pile on all this other stuff. Um, if I'm in charge of a company supply chain, I'm sitting there going, this is absolutely loads to take on and to consider. And so, and some of these things feel like they're in conflict to each other. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, how do you, how do you think through some of these challenges and kind of come up with a resilient process? Yeah. <clears throat> so that, that's why I think it's, it is an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And it's also an opportunity that is linked to being more sustainable. And, and that's when at the end of it, if you really think uh, deeply about it, what is the difference between being more resilient and being more sustainable? You know, you just use resilient in sort of in, in context of resisting to supply chain disruptions, whereas being more sustainable is more in the context of social, environmental sustainability. But in both cases, um, you affect res resilience, sustainability by all of these really large numbers of decisions that companies make, sort of like designing the product, what comp material you put it in, who you buy it from, where are the facilities that make them, how do you transport them around? Uh, how, and, and, and there's a lot of, um, and there's a lot of these trade-offs that companies are doing, both in the case of sustainability as in the case of resilience. Because yeah, if I look at the price I'm getting now uh, by, buying from the cheapest vendor halfway around the, the world in China and then uh, buying it six months before, shipping it through a container, cheap one, having intermediaries, stocking it and so on, the total and the cost is going to be, is going to be low. But what's, the, what's the, the problem with it is that, and in many cases, these decisions are made. Mm -hmm. We're really looking at efficiency-driven, TLC-driven decisions. Uh, and you don't care about maybe uh, putting in more expensive material, which is not made in a region where there's hurricane or a region where there's sort of other kind of issues. And the opportunity is just like when you're assessing the trade-off between, okay, what's my emissions? What's my future impact on sustainability? Those things need to be uh, financial measured. And that's the opportunity. So we install the metrics uh, that are going to allow these decentralized, all of these decentralized decision makers, product managers, purchasers, facilities to, to, to inform these decisions and, and, and make the right trade-offs. But it's, what I'm hearing is that there's just absolutely no easy answer to this because it, you know, it can't just be you move everything closer or you go for price. It just seems like there's, it's a much more complicated process than it maybe ever has been. That's right, that's right. It's a, yeah, absolutely. And you need some yeah. data science and AI to do it better. Absolutely. Until it takes over, right. There are huge amounts of challenges out there. How do we deal with higher interest rates for longer? What is the energy transition going to mean to volatility and long-term inflation? How do we ensure that all these gains in financial stability aren't undone by the other part, you know, the non-banking sectors of the economy? And how do we actually take advantage of all these questions around supply chains and use them well so that we don't all go into the supermarket and go, well, where is it? Not even where do we get it from, but why can't I find the thing um, we're actually looking for? So while that was, um, I guess, up and down emotionally, I would say, uh, <laughs> I do thank you all for joining us this afternoon. I really appreciate it. And thank you very much to our amazing panelists. Thank you.